so a little bit first, I, I really want to know my audience a little bit. Uh, so how many of you are programmers? So majority. How many of you uh, are using Unity for something? OK, so quite heavily. Good, good, brilliant, because that's really my turf on Unity and all of that. So how many of you are non-programmers but would love to make a game someday or are making games? Brilliant, because this is also for you as well. So we are not in there yet where like, anyone could start and make their whatever MMO game, but that is hopefully something that we will eventually get into. So um, I'm going to talk about smarter tools. So like smart tools is not really a term, but it's more like, okay, um, if you think about like, you know, uh, tools that will help our life and, and take a lot of like uh, stress about the production out of from us. Uh, so they are like some most of the smartest tools are like uh, something really automatic, like build pipelines, importers, that sort of things. But also like these tools that uh, remembers for you and like restricts you a little bit, like gives you like a framework to work, so you don't you know break something at the same time. So uh, just a quick uh, recall about myself. Um, at some point of time, I was like a little kid, and uh, I was like, video games are really cool, and I have this like Commodore 64 computer, and I, I really wanted to make games, and I, I got this like basic uh, book about like, you know, programming, and so the first things I did was like you know text-based games, and then I really wanted to do graphics at some point. I want to have sprites because I saw like they are they are games that has colors and things, but I had no idea how to do that, so I had this like piece of, like, I have a piece of paper with, like, you know, grid on it, and I was just filling the, the pixels in the grid and figuring out where would the, some colors be and all of that, and eventually I made an array of that, and that was the way I get, like, um, sprites the game and graphics. So eventually at some point I got this, like, real computer with graphical uh, UI, and it was an Amiga, and I was like, wow, this is amazing, I can make it had a mouse and you could do windows and buttons and it was like, you know, completely blown out. Like, I was really like, no, this is some magic. I will never figure out how to do that. But eventually I was able to make like, uh, with Amiga, very, very, very simple, my first sprite editor for, for putting pixels to the game. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm saving so much time with this one. So like, because I didn't know what, you know, you could actually make graphics with, uh, like deluxe paint and, and load the images somehow. I, I didn't know that it's even a concept or even something possible. So for me, it meant like, you know, wow, I'm saving like, like a half a year of work doing this. Like I can click pixels uh, with my mouse. And, and these tools were awful. They were horrible things. So um, eventually I, I got into, uh, not Exactly after that, there was a little bit more interest in the tools. So um, eventually, I got hired at Unity and working on, on, on mostly on the 2D tools. And at that point, uh, Unity was this like 3D engine that you make 3D games with. And some people tried to make 2D games with that, and it kind of it wasn't great for that. And uh, when tackling that issue about uh, about the 2D, it wasn't ne really making any 2D tools at all. Like 2D wasn't the problem way. It was more about the accessibility was the problem. And, and the tool automation and the tools were like dumb in a way that what you, the people wanted to create with that. Because the things to solve was not that you could put sprites on the screen, but how could you make games easier with Unity? Because for most of people, like 2D games are the first games that you ever do because that's like, it feels simple. It is like you know that's what you want to, uh, uh, you know, start working a fiddle with that. So the focus was why, how we can make it accessible, but still you could go a little bit deeper. So even doing like simple things that you can you can think of uh, a picture and drag it to the game and it comes to sprite. Or if you take Five, select like five pictures and drag those, it will become an animation. Or a little bit more smarter stuff, which is tile maps. So you can uh, select a tile, you create a brush out of it, and while you are actually painting the map, let's say you're painting a road, so you make a, a vertical road, horizontal road, and when they intersect, you want to have a different 
sprite in there. So that's already that we are doing a lot of things behind data and just putting a single sprite. We have a little bit of logic there behind what is happening. So eventually, we, we, we at least we thought, like our team, that we, we really nailed this Udini 2D, but at least it's used in quite a lot of games. So um, then we moved, actually, uh, part of our team into uh, working on Ori, uh, Orient Blind Forest and Will of the Wisp uh, game series. And that's uh, like this 2D platform game uh, from, um, from um, Xbox and, and PC. But what is really brilliant was that is the, is the team. The team was super, super tiny. So I think they, at the original Ori, uh, we, there was only like roughly like seven, I think it was seven people working on that. And by the will of the Wisp, I, I think it was expanded to, to roughly 20 people or something around that line. And it, it was really like blown away, like uh, how the tools were designed for that, because it was all about that the whole team can produce everything from the start to finish and implement all the stuff. So the programmers were mostly just kept away from the production in the way that, you know, the programmers are like, you know, you're a different breed completely. Don't mess up our game. Let's, like, you know, let the people who actually understand what games are and what is brilliant about it to actually create it. So and after working on those, we decided that, okay, uh, we have this really tight, uh, like this uh, tech tools team formed up, like from Unity and going through different productions. So let's work with this company that was making this downward spiral game. And the idea of that game was that they wanted to explore this like the, the VR area and make a game for like there's like a single player and uh, online co-op story modes and it had to work with all possible platforms like uh, PlayStation VR and Oculus and, and Vive and without the VR heads and all of that stuff. And other one was that the game should be able to be done without any programmers. So only the artists and designers should be able to do that in one year of time and with a team of six people. So that is like going to be like quite a big part of the talk that I'm going to talk today and like how like all these tools uh, were coming together. Um, by the way, uh, the timer, can I get that rolling? Is it working? Okay. Not right now, at least. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so w what we can figure it out, like while working, is like what we really want to do is this, like this power to the creatives. So uh, that was just the whole idea that if you are an artist or an audio engineer or whoever is that is producing content, you should be able to to create that and implement that. So you should never have anyone in between there. And that is something we're seeing quite a lot in, in these companies, that there is these gatekeepers. And especially in small teams, that doesn't work out. If you're a larger production company, then yes, then you have these production lines that are completely designed a different way. Uh, but as a small team, uh, everybody needs to be able to work directly in the game. And they should never be uh, buggering anyone else to do, do something for them to actually to implement what they need. So uh, anyway, like I say, like you know, smartest tool uh, are like they are like the invisible ones that we never see, we never think of, and like all the modern game engines are really good examples of that because these are like you know, import pipelines, uh, light baking, uh, build automation, something like you know, that the engine knows that how the textures need to be compressed to a certain platform, and this awful looking thing in here, it was like one of those like problems that uh, we noticed that one of the productions had, that there was like big levels that where the artist needs to work and they were using Unity's this light probe tool. It's like you have to put these like spheres inside of your game level and arrange them around and the editor actually to do, like doing that is completely horrible. So it was taking uh, tons of time for them to actually work on that. And other one was been the, the scenes, and the levels were changing places a little bit. They needed to actually update those light probes around and doing lots of like manual work to make it happen. And only time we could actually detect that they didn't work was after the, all the build process and all of that was uh, went through, and it was like an hours and hours of work. Then it's like you know, image you know, it's like ah, oh, there's something broken just in this area of the game. 
and it takes maybe on play testing like uh, six, seven hours to get in that point, which is completely useless. So eventually just we made a simple tool, well, simple tool, to detect uh, what is inside of the level, what is outside of the level. And based on that, we have a little bit of heuristics on like where we should we put all, all of these spheres around. And eventually that is then automated that when the builds, uh, build system starts going on, then we will see like, you know, it will just put these things in the right places. And if they are a little bit in wrong place, eventually uh, we will just feel, feel with the wiggle with some uh, heuristics or we will add some manual uh, manual spots to, uh, to figure that out. Uh, so otherwise like about smart ones is like everything that is context sensitive that is all about on tools that it, they need to help you uh, on doing your, your daily work. So one is that like, you know, when tracking an image, did I have, did this have a laser? I don't remember. It does have laser, yeah. Which it's like the laser button properly, yes. So, <laughs> so when the user is tracking an image uh, to a wall, depending on the, what is the base material, and this one is much closer, it's like metallic surface, so it will gain uh, all the like properties from the surface. And when it comes into this textile side, it actually gets more matte and the lighting changes and it changes everything like how the materials work. But then again, when tracking a font file, we can of course know like, oh, probably the user wants to add some text into the game. So we can, okay, let's create some stuff for the user so you don't have to manually create components and that sort of things. And eventually, uh, there's a group of tools that are more like uh, also context sensitive, but at the same time, like they're content sensitive, that they know that how the content should actually work. So in this case, there's this, uh, what is called a nine sliced image that has a little bit more information like normal maps, height maps, metallic maps, and that sort of things. So when scaling it up, we don't actually scale the texture at all, but instead, instead we will repeat the, the middle parts of the texture. So eventually you can like have a painting with the frames and what is inside, side in there. And these are already something like, they, they will get your like production speed and iterations much, much faster because it means that uh, you don't have to install like let's say uh, 3ds Max Maya Blender or something like that to do something in your level. You just you know throw stuff in there, and then you see like what actually works and what doesn't work. And if something needs a little bit more work in there, then it eventually you can start up your uh, preferable program, Photoshop, a Blender, and do like do it like properly. So um, and this is also like something like pretty much everyone on the team can do like. As long as you know the basics of the Unity and you know a little bit of the tools, you can start building the levels and put some clues, put some tough stuff in there. So it's kind of like really easy to approach on that side. So anyway, uh, so I've been working on with a lot of different other studios using mostly using Unity, but other engine as well, like Unreal and whatever. And there's this one thing that really blew my mind is that, especially in small studios, there is this this thing happening that uh, I noticed that. Um, it was quite common when I when I talked with the studios, how about the processes and what is like lacking. And uh, at some point, I was playing a, one game and mentoring a team and asking, like, you know, like what is happening with the audio? Like, there's no sounds at all in the game. And I understand, like, you know, sounds are usually added like really late process. But this was like a really late process already, and there was no like no like sounds at all. And I asked the programmer, like, what is the thing? Like, you know. Uh, you know, I ask someone and say like, yeah, you know, I just haven't had the time to implement the sounds. So he had like this bank of like, audio engineer has sent him like 500 sounds in a zip file and it was his job to implement those into the game. And that was like, I, I couldn't like figure it out, like, you know, how we could be in, in game studios in that sort of situations, because it means that you have your, your, deep sea diver that is like the smartest guy in the whole company, maybe it's, it's your like most highly praised asset you have. It's a C++ programmer that can make a whole engine and all kind of things. And his work is implementing sounds. And that started me thinking like, maybe this isn't the best way of like using your resources on the team. 
So uh, that started me thinking, okay, well, you know, there are these visual logic tools that people use and all of that. So, uh, so I, I, we, like our team started to dig down a little bit deeper. Okay, is there something usable or what is the problem? Like why people are not using them or are they using them? All of that. So uh, on the Twitter, I, I noticed this picture at some point, which is pretty much like uh, how people feel like what visual programming is. It is this uh, hell spaghetti that nobody understands. And if you have a game designer or someone who works in a game like this, the moment the person leaves the company, this needs to be completely just you know burned out and built, and somebody else comes over and starts building something cleaner that will end up looking like that once again. So uh, eventually what we wanted to have is like this, spaghetti free, maintainable uh, with the performance. And maintainable meaning that you know you could somebody could actually uh, look at what is happening in the game, uh, but also uh, maintain it. So I mean like you know change it somehow. So um, of course, like I was like, well, we make tools. So like, how hard can it be to make a, a complex logic system with all kind of these things to make super generic games that everybody be able to learn? And it appears it's it's really hard. So uh, the first thing was like uh, we, we were like thinking about this whole process was like uh, going from the simple to complex. And this is more like because as human beings, we all learn. A slightly different way, but in the same time, like there's a lot of these things. Like we learn, we have these certain steps. So there's leaves like we will forget with a certain rate. We will remember things uh, in a certain way, and we also will learn things in a certain curve. So we have to think about a lot about how people learn, and because right now we have this problem that we have artists and designers that needs to learn to make game logic and they don't think like programmers think because programmers think in a very specific way like we, we have to think like you know how programming languages work and how that actually relates to computers and how computers work so we have to get rid of that mental model completely and also like how do we introduce these things because we can't uh, make up a lot of new abstractions because these are people who sometimes come to the tools and sometimes does some logic, but most of the time they do something else. So every time that they come to these tools, uh, we have to follow certain design principles that they are, are familiar from other tools and they don't need to think of new abstraction, abstractions. So uh, we, we started to like, you know, uh, decided to approach this in a Lego way that, you know, programmers create the Lego blocks that are like, interconnecting blocks with, with certain style. And eventually they think like, you know, like everybody uses that, even the programmers uses these blocks to, to create the game. And, and with the basic blocks, you can like, kind of like block out the whole game, like what is the game is going to roughly be about? Like, you know, at what point is there some sounds playing or we are loading some levels and whatever is happening in the game. And eventually, when it comes to like these game specific things, like let's say like it's going to be a Star Wars Lego game or a Egyptian Lego game, so then you start crafting those very specific blocks to the system. And if something doesn't fit to the system, it's, it's fine. Then let's just do the old old school custom stuff for the game. But still, we need to allow everyone to build the game at the same time. So when talking about simple, this doesn't look at simple. Um, but this ended up being the, the simplest way for us to, to define the logic uh, inside the games. And uh, but a few projects and like there's at least like one console title released using these methods is that roughly 90% of the game uh, ended up being something like this. So uh, so we had these three parts. First is a variable. Uh, I think most of the audience at least uh, knows what, what that is. So it's, it's something like, you know, uh, how many points the player has or how much of damage or some values. It could be a texture, it could be a sound effect, it could be some other object in the game or assets. And the next one is the classical if condition or like when do we do something? Is it on a collision? Did the player press a button? Is player's health zero? Did something else happen? It, like, did it take 60 seconds? Uh, since the game started. And eventually we had very simple list of kind of like verbs. 
what is happening then. So we have like add points, destroy, animate, wait for one second, play a sound. Because these are like these things like, you know, that is like the dirty stuff when doing games and most of the games are something like that. So you want to have a, something reactive from what you are, what you are doing. Uh, so for like for the teams, uh, it seemed like you know this was like when they were working on Unity. Otherwise, and adding content in there, this uh, this felt like as an editor, it felt like for the users to be uh, pretty same that the rest of the Unity. So there was no new abstractions. Some simple click click clicks. I will add just wait command and that sort of things in there. So it was really easy to do those things. And same time, we noticed that okay, now the balance in production is also really changing because. Now uh, the program, like the team, has just one single programmer, so the programmer actually has time to figure out uh, other systems and other problems of the game, and it, it frees a huge amount of time for the whole production. So uh, we started even more simpler than this one on the website, but eventually we noticed that okay, uh, the people wanted to have a little bit more the kind of details and going there, like tweak a little little things in there. So then we started supporting some. A uh, little bit more on on the editor, so like you could define a uh, curve, some behaviors for these ones, and eventually, and you know, it started to be like okay, now the people can go a little bit more into detail, but still they can start simpler, and then when they feel ready, that okay, I'm going to explore something a little bit more complex. That's like then they can learn in their own pace, but. Like approach like this one is, is good for like these reactive things, but when you have to like do a decision like did the player press button A or button B, then it's a different story already because now it opened up a lot of issues and a lot of problems. So uh, for that, uh, that was like the next iteration why we're working on on the on the productions was to that you can upgrade this simple thing into a, a craft. So eventually it's like. We are just showing this very simple graph as a list. So this allowed us to to make a, like another step for for the artists that I've been working on on this simple list right now. And okay, now I'm ready to go into this a little bit more complex mode, and that's the moment you can go in there because uh, there's something like when you start defining logic, you always think that the issue that you're solving is much more simpler than it actually is, because in games we are always creating something new, and it, when it's new, it means that we don't know something, anything about it, or not much, unless we know some about something, the more naive we are about like the like the problematics of it. So quite commonly there was like this situation where you start doing something simple, but eventually it's like, yeah, but I actually need uh, some sort of craft or something like that for, for solving this issue. Uh, so about the spaghetti side, so uh, this ended up being uh, one of the most complex uh, these crafts in the game in the end, which was kind of like I was kind of surprised. I was expecting to be having like something even bigger and something like that, and was kind of like disappointed. So I was thinking like you know like man like the people didn't really utilize the system or something like that. But when figuring out like you know how many using uh, tools like these in real uh, in real life then. Uh, it seemed like this was actually really well balanced. So on this one, uh, every one of these nodes, when you select them, uh, you get into these more than these details of like what actions are done and how we figure out like what is happening in the game. We should be transitioning like another kind of like a state. It's not really a state machine either. So it was a good thing, like you know, you could easily see the overall uh, what is happening in the game, but same time going more into the details. And at that point, uh, this whole thing became kind of like the teams, the, the common ground where everybody was discussing about because the, the audio engineers, the designers, the artists, and the programmers, they all work through this tool eventually. So when they had a problem, they had to discuss something, something, so they could actually use this as the as the reference for for everything. So they just, just go in there, and they could have a pretty proper discussion on how to solve these different issues. And and that was really brilliant because they, that solved a lot of the communication issues we normally had with with artists and programmers uh, because. Uh, 
what is really common is that, okay, like the modelers, uh, artists easily use really high-end uh, complex software, like let's say like 3ds Max, and there's a lot of these concepts. And same these concepts are, they are still in the game engine as well, but they just named differently. So we had constant this battle of like, you know, that the programmers understand it really talk to each other that well, but when they had this some sort of like visual basis where to talk about something, they it actually was uh, much easier in that side. So, and I think like an uh, audio engineer, he, he fell in love in this whole system and he, he generally jumped in there and started modifying the, the game logic to fit much better for the audio. And that was a big thing for us, like that uh, the whole team was properly utilizing it and changing the logic so it can fit a little bit more in there, like like having uh, some sound playing before the accent, just like, you know, so sort of like 100 milliseconds before something happened to have a, just this exact script, like, uh, clip and then after something else. Um, and eventually this, okay, this is like, you know, whole progress, so like it'll be, we were learning while we were building a tool and it was actually brilliant that, you know, we had this kind of an idea and, you know, okay, we, we gonna solve all kinds of things and we gonna cause all kinds of different kind of problems. And, but this was one of the coolest things. Uh, so after we went from that list to, to upgrade this graph, uh, all the all the actions and comparisons, all the the problematic side is in the graph. So only thing we were left was a list of variables that we linked to the graph. So then it it really hit to us like, oh, we can actually share this uh, between the game all around, and it actually feels more like the traditional way of like making these mono behaviors, these components. So it's kind of the same thing like uh, because previously. Uh, the split was that the programmers create the components that the designers all use. But now we can like, you have these core routines and all of that, or your own frameworks for like running something in there, like waiting and playing audio and that sort of things. But now we, we made the split where the scripting is done in a slightly different place. So it meant that the designers and artists were now creating components and uh, that was really like, I was really into like, wow, this is, this is something new. And eventually, like, we could use that one single craft for all the weapons in the game. So by just changing uh, the attributes we're using in there, like, so let's say like if we want to change the, the, the overall behavior or something, uh, we would just say, say like, you know, Okay, this gun is going to have a different uh, different bullets when it shoots. Uh, they're going to the the barrel, the end of the barrel is going to be in a different place, and define the shells. Uh, how many? How much ammunition is there? What is the maximum ammunition? And that sort of things. So this ended up being like really powerful tool for for the whole team to to create the game, and then we started to really to. Well, the team started to use it for everything. And this kind of like became a little bit of a problem as well. So it was super powerful. We even used it into like the test framework. So we have like build pipelines and we are doing all the smoke tests, performance tests, even feature tests using this system because we can have like, like a list of simple actions that are just running in there. And we don't have to think about much of like, you know, uh, coding them. We can just like, you know, slap them together. So it's really fast to create those things. And, but then we started to have different problems, and one, is, of course, is the performance. But because when you give a lot of power to the, to the team, but if you don't same time think about the tooling, about the performance side of things, then you will end up having problems in there. So it's brilliant that everybody can create a game really fast, but because the, the how you create it so fast that nobody keeps up with that. And there was like all kind of weird problems with that. Like one is then optimization part. Okay, we, we had to have a lot of automation to have automatic performance testing. And and other thing is like that people don't know what is in the game. Because it's so easy that I, I will just add this model in here and I will make this 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 enemy going in here, but I will actually tweak the AI just a little bit for this one. So there's going to be this Easter egg and this kind of behavior thing. And then the game is filled with that, all kind of little things that they, they, no one even knows. Like, 
and I think it's a brilliant way because it's it's really organic what is happening. But same time, in QA perspective, it's uh, it's a living hell because you can't specify like, oh, what is new in the game? Like, oh, I don't really know. And uh, previously, I worked with one one designer that <laughs> um, it was like this um, funny indie uh, project we we're doing, and I, I loved working with him. He was really organic and creating all kind of things. And every time I, I jumped to the game and started doing something, asking like, hey, what, has been, what have you been doing? The only thing I see, like, you know, there's like one month full of commits, insane amount, and he's not telling me. And only thing to figure it out is to actually play the game and really deeply. And um, it was a good process. It was a brilliant game afterwards, but still it's uh, something to think about. And one was uh, a horrible mess that we ended up being is that we, we had a constant merge problems. That, because, okay, now everybody was working really tightly in Unity, and when you work on the, in the scenes, and you have multiple people working on different side, and, and when you're working really fast, like there's merge conflicts all the time, and people are losing their work, and someone commits something, something someone updates something, and people don't really know how version control works, and the programmers are losing their mind, like, you know, how can you understand, like, this basic branching something, blah, 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 feature branch and all of that, and the artists are like, you know, what? I, I, they just want to have the SVN back. So, um, so this became a huge issue, and at some point, I started to really feel like, okay, we are actually losing uh, a lot of like the good parts about our fast tools because we have so much of merge conflict, other things happening that people are getting uh, really pissed off. So, like, uh, because they're losing today's or one hour job at some point. So, eventually, we have like this. Uh, I think like one of us that we have this uh, Skype or Slack channel. It was like a scene log channel where everybody just say like when they're gonna work on something. I'm gonna work on this area. I'm gonna work on this area. But as the development was getting faster and tools were getting better, it was, it was feeling troublesome, this whole tool of like, you know, I have to write something in somewhere, and people thought like, I will just quickly do this thing. I will just quickly sneak this thing in, and then something breaks to someone else, and someone loses a day of job, and they are screaming through the Skype of like, you know, I will, they will flip the table, I'm gonna quit the company. So, um, for that, like, it was such a troublesome thing, and we tried all kind of uh, different ways of solving it, and I think this is like one of the best tools I've ever done. It's super simple, we're not solving this huge complexity of making games, we are just solving something much, much softer, is that we added these little locks when you, when you open up scenes in Unity, so with this simple lock that we, you just click, and the other, all the other users we see, oh, Somebody is working on exactly on this area, and it's like non-intrusive, very soft communications between the team, because when you have a communication problems, then the best way of fixing that is to remove the communication uh, completely. So there's that the whole need for communicating. Okay, well you have to still communicate and click the button, but still uh, this ended up being uh, really brilliant and. What happened there, like, you know, I, I felt like, you know, we felt like, you know, hey, the team's overall happiness just increased a lot. People were much more happier. They didn't, they were like less stressed out because there were certain things that, you know, didn't mess up their, their daily, daily work anymore. And that really started me thinking like, you know, uh, exploring a little bit more about this side of like, hey, what gains are there in this soft communication side? Like, like, that you can show, like when you are working at Unity, you can see real time that you know where some scene, someone is working on the scene. So like, it, okay, that's the person is there. There's the name, maybe a little avatar, and the, the scene camera, and other user is is working in there. And even this already started to feel like that I'm not working on this game alone. There's a lot of us working here at the same time. So you started to gain a lot of these. Uh, these different kind of information that affected your workload. Or like, like, oh, that person is working in that side, so actually I will just move to that side of the game. So you don't have to poke anyone, stop anyone from working, and it becomes more like this hive mind that knows that the game needs to be done, the game is shaped like this, and it needs to have all of these things, and I will just go, okay, I will just go there, do my stuff, commit that, and then you look, okay, hmm, okay, there's a free spot, I will go there and start working on that one. So it just took a lot of stress and uh, 
and l- like lots less process like from like you know all these all these nasty process tools we could like give it on oh that's fine um so uh, anyway like uh, like i we noticed that in the team like when everything is rolling really nicely uh, eventually, like the team is happy, people have better work-life balance, and in most of the cases, it's, it's just like you know, uh, removing few like button clicks, and these can be like really uh, big things in tools. Uh, mostly, right? There's this like you know, there's this one extra button click that somebody has to put do, but when you do it, it like you know, two hundred times a day, and the button is just like three pixels too small. You you know, you really start feeling it, and so you feel like you know, I don't want to go to work tomorrow because there's this like just you don't even know why you're irritated. You're just really irritated about something, so it comes all down in that. Um, so in the sugar in the bottom, if you want to try the tools or if you want to use the tools, get the tools, fiddle around with the tools, uh, do something with that. Um, we have a bunch of tools that we've been doing on that URL and those are free and we are open sourcing most of the stuff that we have right now. Uh, we decided to, uh, let's just give it out free, uh, for everyone. So, uh, so I think like the first thing was like you know uh, getting these ones that I was just like talking about out and uh, there's a little bit more that we're working that is more like if this was our, like a craft for logic we are doing like craft for data processing and that is more like uh, like for creating these uh, fancy like designers like you know you can design tools without programming Pijama. that's what we are trying to achieve so making all that these fancy tools like uh, what Assassin's Creed was using for like creating, uh, generating CD blocks and all of that. So uh, more like the data funneling, but in a way that uh, we can get the power for, for the designers and uh, technical artists instead of the programmers. Um, so this is pretty much my, my talk for here. And, and I think we have plenty of time for questions now. Okay, all right, I see someone over here. Here we go. Um, well, thank you for the talk. I really appreciate uh, your initiative to open source your stuff. It would be nice to take a look at it. But I also have a question. The sort of history that you described about the evolution of your tools and the problems that you faced is quite generic, actually. Uh, everyone has these problems. Yeah. So uh, I noticed one. Uh, advantage of your uh, tools, which is visual content locking. Can you quickly come up with several other advantages, advantages that your system has over other existing established systems like blueprints? Yeah, uh, so coming from the logic side on the blueprints and all that, um, so on blueprints, you still have to, like, it's a visual scripting and you still have to think like a programmer. So the mindset of like how the logic works, and it, it's, it's different. It's kind of like how to specify like what it means to think like a programmer, but they, we, when we are testing out of these ones, like our artists and designers, they're like, you know, ah, we don't like that. It's like, you know, this, like it's two fine grain definitions of what can be done. And other one is that the programmers were hating it because it's like this full power, like a C++ in visual form, but they didn't like to give that power to their, to their team because they want to specify uh, what is the frame where the people can work it. So, and we didn't want to get rid of the programmers. I think like the best way is like, you know, you have these amazing programmers and amazing uh, uh, creatives working together, and, but it's all about like splitting the work in the right place. So we wanted to have these programmers doing these uh, much uh, more like modular pieces of code that can be easily optimized and maintained, and while giving us like certain amount of access for the for the designers. So we made it like very generic, like in it's not like super generic. So <laughs> like uh, we decided to make the whole system way that uh, it has nothing in it; it's just a graph. And the programmers will make the pieces in there. So it could be that, like, you know, you don't even want to use variables or you don't even want to ha- get any math operands in there. And the only things there could be is just like uh, a dialogue system. <coughs> only thing is like, you know, feel for the string that you write text 
And depending on what the user does with that, there's like a different dialogue coming out and with different sounds. So that flexibility, like more like same time that the programmers can define what, what is the framework to work at and not making it like over generic. So there were like a lo lot of these like, you know, these like, you know, the devil is in the detail kind of moments that we were always like uh, pushing a little bit away. So we, we tried pretty much every tool that was, uh, was available in there, like, you know, Playmaker and uh, Bol Bolts eventually as well, and a bunch of different stuff. And none of them, all of them has a little bit different problems. And some of them was like serialization based. So we have this um, problem with the, the conflicts. So all the data, all the logic that actually had to be, it had to be in an asset. So when people work on the logic, it will not affect the scenes at all. So the serialization doesn't change. So we will have much more fluent uh, production going on. All right. <laughs> I guess I will have to check it out. Yeah. And I want to, we have a Discord channel. I want to get you in there so we can uh, go deep. <laughs> uh. Hello, thank you very much for the talk, very thank interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions. So first of all, do I understand correct that you are working with uh, distributed version control systems such as Git or Mercurial and not on uh, server control such as Perforce? Uh, so uh, actually, we've been mostly working on, on some of the games. Uh, tons of studios still use SVN. So <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know either, it's like, it's so a weird universe where you live, but the point of view is actually be migrating to plastic as CM. And it's the same thing as the Perforce that it has uh, the locking system in there, like mm -hmm. asset locking and all of that. And we actually made it a tool in a way that it can be hooked into the version control. So when you lock something, it actually locks it from the server. Oh, cool. But what is uh, important was that it's in the context. Because if you have to alt tap into a separate program, uh, you don't necessarily remember to do that, or if the asset is locked and you did your job and all of that, maybe you will just forget to unlock it for everyone else. So we had to have this soft locking system somehow. And otherwise, I don't think it was like we had to have like, it was like it was a simple tool, but it was insanely complex because we actually had to have a separate server running on, on Azure Cloud for that because our team was really distributed all around and we didn't want to have this be part of the version control, instead a real-time tool when somebody's working on something. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it can be hooked in into something like that, but people just, if it's a hassle, if you have to move from one program to another program to do something for the process, uh, people tend not to do that, just because. So, uh, okay, so yeah. uh, this scene locking is soft locking. Okay, so uh, have you ever had such very strange situation? For example, Abstract John stands, starts working on particular scene one, and he seems to have about a couple of days of work, and then Jane also needs to work on this scene, and she says, okay, John's working, I have another scene. Then John goes to sick leave for one week, and scene is locked, and Jane has a lot, he already made a lot of work, and Jane still needs, because she's tight on timelines, and then eventually she says, okay, I will submit it, or, oh, then John comes back from sick leave, he understands, well, where is my job? I cannot update it. Yeah, I well, had such situations. poor John, I feel like that <laughs> case. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we thought about that a lot, how, how to fix that, but then we're like, you know, wow, we are re really good at making tools. I don't think we are really good at making version control systems, so we believe that into like those like more smarter people. So only thing we could do is like doing just the the hookup for the for like perforce and plastic, but that that is the problem we're talking about. And it's like you know well, yeah. well, meh. let's just make the tool so fast that if you lose some work, you can recreate that really much much faster way. So yeah. that's another one like no undo, just you know okay, keep cool. on creating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, that's a, a really great talk. I think the um, decreasing the click count of common actions is something that's really close to my heart, um, something that I really like doing. Um, when you were like deciding what you wanted to make faster for the designers to do, you know, one click rather than 10, how did you sort of prioritize which things to make faster? Did you ask the designers? Did you have like telemetry from the tools, like this designer is spending all day using this specific menu? Hmm. Or did you just basically just talk to them and ask them what's important? 
No, the problem with the, all the information is always it's, uh, it's filtered. If you ask someone what is wrong, it's filtered. They think that this is wrong, and usually they have already thought about the solution, and then they're telling the problem from the perspective of what the solution is for that. And which means that you don't have raw data because usually these problems are not like the problem is somewhere else. What is is like the the what people experience in overall. So what I do is I, I just creepily stare when people walk behind their backs. <laughs> <laughs> And that's been the best way of doing that. The same thing as like game testing. If you ask a gamer, like, hey, what could be better in the game? Well, <coughs> well, okay, that, that data is completely completely biased. So same, same thing when there are people who use the tools. And when we use these tools, uh, we are really serious about it because it's, it's a tool that I use every day. I love it. I hate it at the same time. And you have all of like emotions, all that kind of things in there. And metrics doesn't really work because uh, we can't collect the metrics because uh, it means that easily you're working through uh, with, through multiple tools. It could be that you start from uh, whatever if, if it's an art pipeline. It could be that the problems start from like let's say a substance designer. There's a substance designer. There's a substance painter. Eventually there's a modeling package. There's an import pipeline. There's some sort of like you know uh, implementation pipeline after that. So then it's all about figuring out from the start to finish like what is the problem. So there's been some actually I was just talking today uh, one of these like really classic problems with the 2D games is that people use Photoshop most of like commonly to make 2D art. So we they actually make the characters, they will layer it up, they will split the character nicely. So they can test like, you know, uh, if there's a piece by piece animations or like, you know, a skeleton animation, like what is the anchor points and how they move. But usually when you get those to the game engine, these are separate pictures. But you already defined what is the hierarchy and what, what is the anchoring positions. So then like, you know, what you should solve on that is actually, because like people t try to solve it in a different way, but they have to, you have to figure out, okay, let's actually uh, maybe make an exporter script for this one or importer script in some point that it will recreate uh, the, the whole image with all the, the anchor points in the right places because they are already specified. Why would you specify it twice? Uh, so sometimes like it's like most time, like you're just watching someone doing once in a while, you will find some really brilliant people that I, I, I love and respect so much that really understand what is the problem and what they want. And it is beautiful to work with people like that. They can just say, like, do this one. I'm like, you know, nah, that will break everything. And then we have a battle for like two, two hours, heated up. And it's like, you know, yeah, actually, you're completely right. And I'm not a smart person at all. And they just like, okay, yes, like, you know, let, let's do this. Uh, so it's like part and part, but I never found like the metric side on, on like you know on the tools to be that effective. We did try that a lot at Unity, but then again, the Unity's user base was so enormous and so wide. So we get all the data, and we're looking at the data it's like you know, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with all this data. Like you know, how how could I make something out of it? because I don't know what kind of game they're working on? Are they doing like a Tetris? or uh, MMO, and there's like a little bit different problems in both. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, any further questions? No? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Great talk. Enthusiastically <laughs> delivered. <laughs> <laughs>